I love this time of year. It's nearly perfect. The autumnal equinox is not far off. There is plenty of sun, though the most blistering of days are fewer and fewer. Some flowers have their second or third bloom. Vegetables planted late are ripening, and the evening and morning air has a, a faint, cool smell that fills your lungs, reminding you of the coming fall and winter. The first few leaves fall as if to warn you, this season too shall pass. There's also an, an awakening that happens. Certain bugs and birds and butterflies make their appearance in Kentucky more alive than they have been all summer. Skippers and bats and beetles and spiders and birds on journeys to unknown places. It's all so alive. And I dare say this in-between season with no name, this bridge between summer and autumn is my favorite time of year. Though there are many favorites, many lovely periods within the cycle of seasons, this one, though, is full of expectancy, full of renewal and possibility, even as the decay of autumn looms. Now, I had an experience recently that could really only occur this time of year, just a few days ago, and it was nothing spectacular or special. I was at my home, and I don't really go anywhere these days. This pandemic keeps reminding us that it hasn't gone away, uh, not yet. And I try to find moments throughout the day to, to get outside, whether running or walking or don't tell too many people, but there's a crank and boom uh, ice cream shop so close to where I live now, which is really why I need to keep running. Uh, other times you'll find me taking a quick stroll through our church grounds, but there's also the mundane. I check the mail. Very exciting, right? Oh my goodness, the minister checks his mail. This is, this is good stuff. And so just a few days ago, stepping out the front door to check it, Boom! It happened. I was suddenly enveloped, covered, practically swimming in the sturdy mesh of an orb weaver spider's web. Now, if you're unfamiliar with orb weavers or you don't like spiders, I'm warning you right now, I'm going to show you a picture of one. So turn away if you must. And here it is. And for those uh, not watching but listening, let me describe this beauty for you. It's called the arrowhead spider, this particular one, and it comes in many colors. But when it tucks in its legs, it takes on the shape of, you guessed it, an arrowhead. And the ones I see most in Kentucky are a beautiful bright orange, the size of uh, about half, a half dollar, bigger if their legs are extended. And with over 3,100 species in their family, they're the third largest grouping of spiders, and they come in brilliant colors and patterns. But what makes them special are their webs. And if you've seen one before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Traditionally, their webs can span uh, over three feet, but that's just the web itself. The supports holding up the web can go even farther. And so it was with the entire threshold on my front porch. A perfect hunting ground for little bugs and apparently humans, too. I appreciate orb weavers. They don't like the indoors much and want nothing to do with humans, though they don't seem to mind when I just observe them. They're beautiful little things. And if you're an arachnophobe, bear with me. This isn't going to go on for much longer. But as I walked into that massive web, feeling the wiry mesh of silk envelop my face, my reaction wasn't the usual one. I didn't do the dance that we humans usually do, though I did rush to the washroom in a hurry. And I did so because I was more concerned about the spider suddenly finding itself on this lumbering primate. I rushed inside and peeled the web off of me, taking notice of the extra gray hairs, and there's quite a few, that have come in when I mistook them for spider silk. And I came back outside to check the mail, and my husband was now there. Uh, he was alarmed at my reaction and joined me outside, and there was the spider, just sitting at the top of the threshold, legs tucked underneath, probably scoping us out, wondering what on earth was happening. My husband nudged it onto a stick and put it in the nearest bush, and off it went to build a more glorious web somewhere else. This time of year is the time of orb weavers, and I can't let go of that feeling, as if being submerged in a web. It was unreal. I'd never experienced something like that, but it made me laugh. It was an apt metaphor for this world of ours right now. We leave our homes every day during this area we live in, and we are enveloped. We are submerged, encapsulated, whatever word works best for you, 
and the mesh of everything around us. There it is. No escaping. No separation. The cry for justice on our streets. The fight to protect our democracy because it is so threatened and so fragile. The red skies of the West Coast, our planet is burning. And the virus is still present, still there, still claiming lives. Over 1,000 Kentuckians, nearly 200,000 Americans, almost a million dead worldwide. That's one million people who are being mourned and buried, lost to this plague. And it continues. Perhaps there's no better uh, example of being submerged in this day and age than trying to breathe through a face mask. And there you have it. The world envelops us whether we like it or not in 2020. And now the, the parallels here to water are obvious, enveloped, submerged, but that's a happy coincidence. Today being the day we would normally celebrate our annual water communion service, the official start of the new church year. But we aren't celebrating as we would church year feels like it never ended. We mark this time still. But we also have to mourn what is lost and hold on to the hope of being together again. If you've never been to a Unitarian Universalist water communion before or have forgotten what it is all about, let, let me tell you a, a quick story. It has everything to do with being stuck in the mesh, the web of life. In 1980, a group of women gathered at the Women and Religion Continental Convocation of Unitarian Universalists. A great long acronym. Uh, but a call had gone out before they gathered. And they had shared stories with one another through letters and phone calls, no email or internet yet, about their struggles as women in Unitarian Universalism. You see, our, our faith is one of high aspirations. We were among the first to ordain women in the 19th century. We've accepted our LGBTQ siblings since the 60s and 70s. We've answered the calls of justice far and wide and defied tyranny throughout our history. But we've also rested on our laurels. And these women knew that in 1980. They still experienced sexism, being underpaid as women ministers or religious educators, of not being trusted in leadership in congregations. And so the organizers asked them, to bring a vial of water from somewhere sacred to them. And as they gathered at the congregation, they joined in a circle and spent the next hours crying, laughing, singing, telling stories of their hardships, their joys, and all the in-between. And as they each told their story, they poured out the water into a common bowl. Their tears became everyone's tears. Their joy, everyone's joy. And as they left, they took a sample of the water home, carrying the stories of all those women with them. And thus, the first water communion was born. And it is in that spirit we gather, as nearly every Unitarian Universalist congregation celebrates this tradition. And we save some of the collected water year after year, the joys and the sorrows, the successes and failures, bright moments and possibilities of this church, an ongoing, ever-flowing and mysterious stream that is our community. And here we are, amidst this COVID time. I said this during our flower communion this past June, that there is a real sense of loss around these beloved rituals. And I think that loss is important. It's important to anchor us in what we are missing here, of what is at stake, of why we choose to be a religious community from different backgrounds and beliefs, pouring out our tears and triumphs. We will still pour out all that is our life, but we lose the, the solemn, messy, powerful heart of this ritual. What would it mean to, to sanitize it with gloves and masks and schedules and liability waivers and uh, wait your turn and orderly pouring? Life isn't sanitized. It's making a mess. It's trying to find the right line to be in in the first place. It's returning again and again and again to pour out more life, more sorrow, more joy, more confusion and clarity. And so we rest in this loss, for it is not forever. Right here, I have a, a sample of the water we keep year after year. Right in this bottle is years of your stories, years of your life. There's water poured into this from beloved people we have lost since then. Walden Pond, a holy site for many Unitarian Universalists, is, is right here. And it will be waiting for us 
waiting for that day when we return and we can keep the tradition alive, waiting for the moment when we can fill up the vases behind me, the pictures behind me, and pour out our joys and our sorrows and all the in-between as one community again. Now, here's what I believe today is all about. Hope. Not hope confused with optimism, but concrete hope. Hope where you are digging your hands into the earth and getting dirt under your fingernails. Now, see, I believe optimism is this sense that things will work out, the glass is half full, and so on and so forth. But hope is different. The book of Proverbs reminds us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And there it is. Hope requires work. It requires attention. It requires flesh and blood and sweat and tears. It requires wading through the enveloping mesh of life. It asks of us to look at what has been lost and to work for that bright tomorrow where, where perhaps the old will never return, but something renewed, something reborn will. And we still pour out our lives into that common bowl of humanity, and new seasons await us. Antonio Machado gets to this hope in his poem, uh, one of my favorites, uh, and he writes, Last night as I was dreaming, I dreamt marvelous error that a spring was breaking out in my heart. I said, along what secret aqueduct, O oh water, are you coming to me, water of a new life that I have never drunk? Marvelous error, what a beautiful phrase. And what if we greeted all of life in that way? Marvelous error. But Machado is getting at hope. For this poem, his words take place in a dream. And it is in our dreams that we can disrupt the patterns of thinking and being that hold us back. We are taught in this culture to always produce, to always work, to always keep on and keep on, onward and upward, forever and ever. Do not let up, do not get sick, do not get tired, produce and keep producing. But here is the marvelous error, the disruption to that cycle. There is a spring waiting to break out in your heart, water of a new life water of possibility, carrying us down the bend into the unknown. And so here we are, caught in the many webs of 2020, caught in the web of life, whether we like it or not. Many things are lost to us, people too, and more is yet to be lost as well, more is threatened. But oh, marvelous error. Oh, life that demands to be poured out in all of its complexity, we will be together again. We will be together again. We will. Blessed be.